Progressive Business Conferences would like to welcome you to today's program, Storytelling That Inspires Donors to Give, What Works and What Doesn't. My name is Anthony, and I will be your conference moderator for today's program. Today's webinar is 60 minutes in length. This 45-minute presentation will be followed by a 15-minute question and answer session. I will prompt you to begin asking questions. The entire program is being recorded and can be purchased at an attendee discount by calling 800-964-6033 or by using the order form included with the conference materials. Please listen to this important instruction. If you should have any technical problems, please press star, then zero on your telephone keypad, and an operator will assist you. We cannot help you unless you alert us to the problem. Press star, then zero, on your telephone keypad. Please remember that it is a violation of our copyright to record the conference. Now I would like to introduce your speaker, Mark Pittman. I will now turn it over to Mark. There may be a few seconds delay before Mark begins speaking. Please be patient. Well, hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. That's probably the uh, most merciful introduction that anybody's ever given me by just saying my name. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my, my Twitter handle is Mark A. Pittman. You can see this right on the top slide there. Um, feel free to tweet me questions uh, if you'd like to throughout the presentation. I will try to, during the Q&A, go back to the Twitter stream. I have that open beside me here. Um, also, I'm going to just, I'll give you a little background about myself. Um, I've been at, working in nonprofits for close to 20 years, so it's about half my life. Um, I've been ask, I joke that I've been asking for money all of my life because isn't that what kids do to their parents? <laughs> they exist to ask them for money. But um, I stumbled into fundraising in particular uh, just a couple years out of college. I did admissions work first and then stumbled into fundraising and found out that I just loved asking people for money. Um, one of the neat things about doing that is that uh, you have to be good at st telling stories. So now I get to go around the world and train people on storytelling. And uh, I've written a couple books and created do some emails and stuff. You can sign up for my free email on, on my t website, fundraisingcoach.com. If you want to do that, every other week I send out a, some article related to some a aspect of fundraising. But today we're going to learn about stories. Did you know these statistics are still fairly current? Um, the 2008 is, 2009 is the most recent information that we have. But from like, around 1995, there were just over a million nonprofits in the United States. And then in two, by 2008, there were just about 1.6 million 501c3s. And for those of you that are from other parts of the world, 501c3 is a special tax status of nonprofit organizations or charities here in the United States. That is the equivalent, that graph that you see there is the equivalent of 800, more than 800 new 501c3s being created each week for 12 years. There is a lot of competition for what we're trying to do. That doesn't include other types of charity organizations, and that doesn't include just the uh, coin jar at the convenience store helping to pay for the neighbor's medical bills. There's a lot of competition. And doesn't it seem like we always want, we all want the same thing? We, we want people's attention. We want their money. We want their support. We want their advocacy. I don't know if you've noticed that donors feel seem to feel more stressed than they have before. They've got all this stuff coming at them. They don't know how to filter it. They don't know how to sort through it. And have you also noticed that donors and volunteers have – they're more strategic with the way they invest their time and their money. They want to know what kind of things are going to happen. They want to know – What's the return on investment of their money? They don't, they're not satisfied any longer with just giving money to a good cause. Many of them want to actually follow that money through and see what is actually done with it. So how do we get sitting across from our donor so that they're smile, their face is smiling, they're interested, they're eager, and better yet, how do we get them to be able to tell their friends about us in ways that we would be proud of hearing? That's what we're going to talk about today. A couple of goals uh, for this session. I want to overwhelm you with useful information. I had uh, one somebody, one presentation I did this, they get frustrated that I used the word overwhelm because they didn't want a negative word like that for um, for people. Fear not. 
this is going to be very practical. What you're, you may feel overwhelmed with is the excitement of the rest of your day trying to figure out and codify and work with your team about it, pulling your organization stories together. And what I also want to do is give you two very practical exercises to get you started with your stories. We're going to look at um, two, just two core ways of looking at stories for your organization. And one that, the last one could definitely transform the way you do it, run all of your meetings. Now, if you've got your handouts there, we, I've given you, in your handouts I gave you um, a bonus, I think it's about 15 extra slides, uh, because we only have 45 minutes today, and I really didn't want to rush through the two ways of telling stories. But in the slides, so you, you just, if you printed them out, um, I understand some of you print them out, so flip through about 15 slides, get to you see the five buckets. Those bonus slides that you all have access to uh, as part of the registration here are, um, they talk about, well, the review is the fact that the, the first five slides of my presentation is a third way of telling stories that Cliff Atkinson, who wrote Beyond Bullet Points, talks about. You should be able to tell your story with a picture and no text on a slide. Uh, be able to paint the problem, be able to make it even more of a problem, and then be able to paint the solution. Uh, and then it also talks about the regular rules of telling stories from Aristotle. Uh, you can see that on the slides. And uh, a, a kind of dummies version of telling stories with uh, some modern examples of uh, how conflict plays into that. All of that is bonus. Feel free to ask me questions about that during the Q&A. But really what I want to focus on um, is the, the, two, the parts of the presentation called the five buckets and in the rule of three. So let's look at the five buckets here. Here's a picture of, of five buckets. Five, I call them story buckets. These are, these are places where you put your stories, your organizational stories. This is where the, the hooks you come, the buckets you, or the place you come back to when something happens in your organization. And you can just, you know, oh wait, I've got, I think I've got a story for that. Where should I look for the story? And you can dip your ladle into one of the buckets and pull out a story and be able to share it at the right time, whether it's uh, during a time of crisis or during a time of celebration, whether it's in front of a whole bunch of donors or just one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a staff member. These are the five organizational stories that uh, can transform, can make up your organization. The first one for this, the five buckets is their founding story. I've, uh, if you've looked at my bio on, on my website, you'll know that I've also passed through church in the past. So I'm going to take each of the five stories and give it a regular name and then a, he, a name from Hebrew or Christian scripture. I'm not trying to push anything on you. Why I did that was if I just gave you the regular name, like the founding story, many of you would think that this could be just in USA. People internationally would just write it off. They would say, ah, it doesn't apply to me. It's just one of those Americans thinking that they're the center of the universe again. All right, I didn't want to do that. So I used the Christian and Hebrew scriptures poor, uh, names so that you can see that this, these five types of stories transcend history. They transcend cultures. And they're something that becomes very... Um, core to our identity as human beings. So the first one's your founding story. I also call this your genesis story. These are the types of things that make up the foundation of your organization. They provide a compass for your, you can keep coming back to the founding stories and and may, just checking in with yourself to see where you are in, in your mid-course corrections. Um, you want to write these out. These will be great for your website. This will be great for your any brochures or collateral material you have. And when you do that, here are some questions that you can answer about these founding stories. The first one is, why was your organization founded? We all need to be inviting people into a fight. We need to be uh, – our organizations were started because there's something wrong with the world. And it, when it wasn't being – something was not being addressed in the world your organization, your nonprofit needed to be started for that. Those are, those are gold. Those are fundraising gold. Those are the ones that we need to invite donors into. Donors love being part of something bigger than themselves. This is where we remind them that. Um, that what was the injustice? What was your nonprofit created to, to make right in the world? When was it founded? You'd be shocked at how many people don't even know when, these, when, when their, their nonprofit was founded. And then who founded your organization? Uh, in the bonus slide that we skipped over for the presentation, you notice that the person, heroes are really important in any good story, and the heroes have to be a human being. Uh, so you need to know who the human beings were that founded your, story, your organization, in large part because 
identify, humans can identify with other humans. They can't really identify with buildings the same way. Now, some of you will have a, it's a little bit of a situation because um, you had founders who are no longer with your organization. That is, a, it gets a little sticky because what you what you need to do in t defining your your story is remember the person and celebrate their values. So talk about the person and talk about the values that that person had or the character that that person had and founding that and then have other stories. Of, uh, you can have genesis stories for each founding. So if you had a, a founder move on and a new person take over, that's sort of another genesis story. And you can talk, you can build a bridge through the values, even if the founder uh, isn't in a good relationship with the organization right now. So those are your genesis stories. Those are foundational. You can use those for employee orientation. You can do all sorts of things with those. The second bucket is my favorite bucket. This is the bucket that nonprofits have the biggest challenge with, uh, in my experience anyway. I call these the Balaam stories. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Hebrew scriptures, there's, there's this prophet called Balaam who, when the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt, they had all these ex-slaves roaming around the desert, and they took over a couple of villages militarily, uh, and freaked out the the powers of that region. Uh, the, the the chiefs were just really concerned because there was this large mass of people that may ha may want to go to war with them. So one of the chiefs went to this guy Balaam, and he said, uh, you, "I need you to curse these people. Uh, call on God and curse these people. I don't because I don't want them to to, to attack me." And Balaam said, I can't do that. I can only tell you what God says. He checked in with God. God said, don't go. And the king kept coming back, sending his messenger back with more and more gold, more and more stuff. Um, and so, as many of us do, we started where he started, Balaam started wearing down. And even though the answer he kept getting from God was don't go, he decided, he said, well, I can go to the cliff. I can overlook these people, but I'm not going to, I can't promise what I'm going to say. I just, I just don't know. And so he gets, he goes on the path and, um, he has a, his donkey stops in the middle of the road and he says, and, and, and he starts kicking his donkey. Why aren't you going? Well, what he didn't see, but his donkey saw was there, there was an angel with a flaming sword ready to cut his head off. And as he was kicking him, finally his donkey turns around and says something to the effect of, don't you see the angel there? Uh, and Balaam starts having a conversation with the donkey. Now, the reason I love this story is when I was pastoring a church, the point that I would make was it's just proof that God can use any ass to do his work, including me. But this is the type, that's the, what you want the Balaam stories to be. These are the stories of where you've messed up uh, in your organization. The, the, the craziest thing that we can do right now in, in our organizations is do the status quo. We don't want everything to be just the way it always, we can't play it safe. In the 21st century, to play it safe means that you're, it's just a slow and painful death. You need to have people that engage in your organization as donors, as volunteers, as leaders, and as employees that are comfortable taking risks, comfortable knowing that they're not going to get um, swatted for thinking on their own or making their own decision in a certain circumstance. Your balance stories for your employees have to do that. They um, inspire creativity. They feel incredibly risky to tell. Think about this for a second. If you're with a team or just with yourself, think about this. What is the, one of the things that we most try to do in nonprofits, particularly when we're talking to donors, and want to inspire them in, in knowing that we're a good investment with their money? We try to talk about our success, don't we? These aren't talking about that until you hear the full story about what a, what a messed up story is like. But these are telling, these are talking about times where you messed up. Now, um, what you do want to do, too, is you want to be careful about these. You're not talking about the time that that employee embezzled all the donors' funds. <laughs> That's not the kind of messed up story that you want to talk about. Let's look at some of the questions that we need to take when we're writing our messed up stories. you, you got to identify, first of all, what values do you want to promote? What are the risks that you want people to be taking? We had um, one office staff that in an organization that I worked with that had – they, they had a dumbass award. And that's what they called it. Every every week when they get together as a staff, they would go around the table from the VP on down to the person, the frontline uh, administrator answering the phones, saying, 
this is my biggest screw up this week. Boy, did I blow it here. Man, I had, I just totally whiffed when I tried this. Every week they get together and they have a little statue that was the dumbass award statue for the week and, and it was an embarrassing looking one so they would put it under the desk because the rest of the organization didn't know that the staff had that going on. But can you imagine how much easier it became for people to fess up when they had a, made a mistake? One of the problems in organizations is we go in and if we make a mistake, we try to cover it up so that nobody will notice or blame us. We don't want to get blamed. You can't blame me. Um, well, this or this particular team, they knew it. They're like, hey, you know, I think I just won the award for the week. Can you help me fix this up? Um, so telling these mess up stories is really good. And you, then you can, you can decide in the terms of donor communications, what are the values you want to, to, to promote? Post-it notes is a great mess up story example. 3M, if you've read the book, good to great, 3M, uh, celebrates their stories too. They were trying to make an adhesive that would stick and stay. And the adhesive, there was one adhesive they used that paper would stick on a wall or stick to a surface, but they, they, they could pull it right off without leaving any residue. Total failure. One of the guys started working with it and doing some other stuff, and he realized that he could use these, that there's a value in having something that would stick to a page or to a piece of paper or to a wall and be able to peel off without leaving any residue. And that's how Post-its became started. Uh, if they hadn't been celebrating their other mistakes, they wouldn't, he wouldn't have felt comfortable experimenting with a failed experiment. He would have just gone on and tried to make what they were originally trying to make. Then you can look at times when people really messed up in the organization. And this is kind of hard, but this could be a fun one for old timers. If your organization's probably over four years old, there's anybody, people feel like there's old timers. Um, <laughs> you can say, what did, what were some of the stories of places where we just, we just goofed? We, you know, Use humor when you ask it. Smile. Have a have a um, happy tone of voice. Um, and then, I, like I said, schedule meetings to tell the share these with your staff. It's, it's to share with your staff. I focus on this a lot because I think when we can take ourselves with a grain of uh, salt and a sense of humor, our donors will that builds integrity with our donors. And so, I really want to challenge your, you and your team as you're listening to this to try thinking about in terms of when you messed up. And some examples of, of good messed ups could be um, the time where uh, if you're working at a hospital and somebody came into the emergency room and one of your nurses on their own initiative drove over to the department store and got a, uh, a coat, a winter coat, because they noticed it was in the middle of winter and um, it was cold out and this person was shivering. So they went to the store, bought a coat on their own initiative. That's the kind of value that you could want to celebrate. And you could tell that story. That becomes part of your institutional stock stories. That's one of your buckets. Hope that makes sense. Again, feel free. We've got questions coming up in just a little bit. Uh, the third type of stories is your suffering stories. These are your Jeremiah stories. These are uh, times of just long suffering when you kind of had to white knuckle it, gut it out, and get through a situation. What I love about these stories is that they're they're grateful when things like the 2008 housing, housing bubble bursts and you're able to – people freaking out. They're not sure where the donor money is coming from. The donors that are giving money aren't sure what your organization is going to do. You could just go di dip into that bucket and pull out another story. Hey, remember in the 80s when the tax laws changed around 87 and we had that kind of – we had a dip like this, too. We made it through. We had to make some, it was uncomfortable, we had to make some tough decisions, but boy, you know, we are, we were able to, to gut it out and, and move forward. Those can instill incredible amounts of confidence in people. Just to know that you're not running around with a chicken, with, like a chicken with its head cut off. You're calm, confident, facing reality. This is going to be uncomfortable. We might have to make some tough decisions. But we, we've survived it. We have every reason to believe we're going to come out through the end, other side of this too. So when you're writing out your suffering stories, you can just look at things like, when does your organization experience tough times? I mean, we don't tend to look at those very well. Um, you could say, what well, you know, check out what are the circumstances. Were they our own fault? Were they circumstances beyond our control? What, what are the lessons that we can learn from those? Be sure to always pull out who the heroes were. It's one of the things um, that you'll hear me repeating over and over because um, 
people like to emulate other people that they value, that they, they look up to, whether it's wearing the same clothes or buying the same life insurance or whatever the celebrity endorsements are supposed to help you do. One of the reasons those work is because there's enough people that admire that particular spokesperson and will want to do what they seem to be doing, which is buying that, using that product. Well, what we want people to do is to also emulate the people that had that ability, the courage, the determination, the focus that got it out during these suffering times. And then, again, what lessons did you learn from this time? Where, what were the takeaways? As you go through any time, any, or any transition, you always want to be looking for takeaways. Whenever you've um, experienced good things or bad things, you, it's great to anchor that knowledge of lessons learned. All right. Fourth story that I want you guys to focus on and, and start writing down is your Phoenix story. These are your Nehemiah stories. These stories feel a lot like the um, the suffering stories, but these are the suffering stories with a with a bright light at the end, like the bird that uh, the phoenix that just goes up in flame and then out of its ashes is reborn. Where are the times like that? These are stories of great conflict. In those bonus slides, we talk, they, there's talk about how. Stories have to, in compelling, interesting, good stories have to have conflict. There has to be something. And the, and the, uh, <laughs> the storytelling for dummies slides talk about um, you get the hero up a tree, you throw rocks at him, and you get him down. That's a, a good story in three acts. Act one, get the hero up the tree. Act two, throw rocks at him. Act three, take him down. Uh, get him down out of the tree. These are where the rocks are being thrown at you. Some organizations that I feel really are good at this in the last year anyway have been NPR and Planned Parenthood. Rocks get thrown at them, and they're able to make millions of dollars in donations because the Congress is going to restrict their funding or Komen um, makes a policy decision and removes money. They, you know, Planned Parenthood got 3 to $4 million in addition to their funding back from Komen from that. Uh, they're really good at telling these conflict stories. Tom Ahern tells us that if you know him, Google him if you don't, because he's just he's got a great email newsletter, too, that comes out, I uh, believe, weekly. Just short, brief, and reminds you how to tell good stories, how to tell, write good fundraising letters and newsletters. But he says we have to be inviting our donors into conflict. That those are the successful communications with donors are the ones we're inviting them on, into a fight. We're helping them say, and we need you to fight with us. Those are the communications that move donors. The reason I call them the Amaya stories is that um, there's a great picture in Hebrew scriptures of Nehemiah going back to build the walls of Jerusalem and being under tremendous attack for doing so. Sanballat and some other folks just were ticked off. Other governors in the region were ticked off that he was built, rebuilding these walls. And so there's this one part where there's so much verbal and physical attack that he has to have all his workers have a brick in one hand and a sword in another. And that's a perfect picture for what these Phoenix stories are about. Where in times of your organization have you had to have a brick in one hand and a sword in another? So here are some of the stories, some of the questions that you can work through with your team as you're as you're considering um, what kind of what what makes up a good Phoenix story for your organization. When have you guys experienced conflict? Was it political conflict? Were there policy decisions that were being made? Was it state funding that's being restricted? And so you have to go out and look in other sources of funding. Uh, where there's, was there physical conflict? Was there emotional conflict? That were attacking the mission that you were trying to do. Um, it, it, I just got into, I don't know if there's anybody on the line here that works in a, um, in a more of a soup kitchen or, or shelter type thing. Physical conflict with one of your residents going at another resident might be better um, for uh, a different type of story where you can celebrate the values of the people that stood up to them. But that may be inherent in your in your mission, too, so it may, be a, it may fit for a Phoenix story. Um, how did you adapt to overcome those conflicts? What were the things that you did? What was the brick in one hand and the, and the sword in another? And remember, the heroes. Who, who are the people that stood up and shined? Who are the people? Because often it's not the people you'd expect. Some of the biggest people that rise out of these types of situations are not necessarily the people with the titles that, that indicate their leaders. They can be people that just you've not heard of before or haven't thought of as, as being courageous, but they become, they really stand out and shine. And the fifth bucket 
is your glorious end stories. These are the, the revelation stories. These are, you know, what your world will look like when it, your organization is no longer needed. These are incredibly important for providing hope. You can get so slogged, you know, tired from the fight, tired, your face is, you know, it's like your face is always in the mud because there's so much junk that you've got to go through. And your revelation stories, your glorious end stories are the ones that remind you what it's all about. They remind your board, they remind donors why it's worth fighting. So some of the stories, the, um, the, these are, I, I kind of breezed through this because this is kind of not obvious. Um, but most organizations have some sort of vision statement, what the world will look like when they're not needed anymore. But, uh, and, but we all know of organizations that, uh, don't have that clearly defined. And so this is, here's some questions that you can use to, to, to write out these particular stories. What will the world look like when your organization is no longer needed? I mean, that's a basic story. How much better will the world be? When, if you're a medical research organization that makes it a lot easier, as you can just say when the disease is cured, we aren't needed anymore. Um, unless your organization has mission creep and then you start finding another disease to, to eradicate, which could be perfectly legitimate. I'm sure once you develop skills in a particular area like eradicating a, a disease or a medical condition, those skills are probably transferable to another medical condition. So I don't mean to mock that too strongly. Um, what will, how will things be different? Who will live better? Who will live more comfortably? Uh, if you're a spay and neuter clinic, will, uh, why will it be better for the pets when you're no longer needed? What will the pet owners be looking, doing that will make it so that you're no longer needed for your, um, your rescue spay and neutering effort? Um, these are all questions that you should be looking at for your glorious end stories. So again, the, the five stories, the five buckets are, I'll just go right up back to that slide here, I believe. Your founding story, your mess up story, your founding story is your Genesis story, your mess up story is your Balaam story, your suffering story is your Jeremiah story, your Phoenix story, uh, your Nehemiah story, and your glorious end stories, which are your revelation stories. These are your organization. And I hope you can see that these would be great for employee training, great for orientation, great for board orientation, and particularly good for telling these stories to donors when they when they want to learn more about your organization. A lot of your time, donors should be spent listening to the donor. But when it comes time to telling them a story, these can be time these can be perfect ones uh, for you to dip the buckets for you to dip into. Now, wouldn't it be great if we were able to hand our our board or our donors a script, they're not always going to remember those stories. They may remember one of the heroes. They may remember something. That's more for our organizational knowledge, those five buckets. But think about this. If you were with a donor, or if you, let's say you're in a rotary meeting, and your board chair was about eight people ahead of you in the buffet line, and Bill Gates was right beside him, you could, the, you could hear the conversation, but you weren't close enough to, to intrude on it. So Bill Gates turns to your board chair and says, hey, I see your board – I hear your board chair of this nonprofit. Um, congratulations. You know, what, why? What, what drew you to that nonprofit? What happens to you? Do you freak out because you know that they're going to just whiff and do an awful – give an awful answer? Or are you psyched because you know that they're probably going to answer in a way that you'd want them to answer as though they're reading your script? If you freak out and because and, your board chair is going to say something like, ah, you know, whatever, I, I'm a board chair of that organization because I just had to had to kind of do community service and they just seemed like a good thing to do, as though you were doing prison time. <laughs> it was just mandated community service. I had to do something. Uh, or they, there's a way that we'll be going through that will tell you how to do this really well. And, and we'll, we'll look at that. But before we look at that, I want to look at elevator pitches. If um, we we're unmuting, if you guys are unmuted, I'd ask you what's a good de definition of an elevator pitch. And when I do this in live audiences, um, the best definitions center around either a 10-second version or a 30-second version of what your organization does. The idea of an elevator pitch is if you go into an elevator with a Bill Gates or a Warren Buffett and they turn to you and say, so what do you do? You should have something pissy and quick that you're able to say that will inspire them 
to want to know more about your organization. And I think you should all have this. Um, the problem with elevator pitches are that they become stale and wrote really, really quickly. Um, if you the last time you were at a business chamber after hours, you could probably hear that. You ask somebody what they do, and they, well, we optimize people's client outcomes by leveraging their potentials, and, and they use all these buzzwords, and it's almost like their mouth is going, but there's no life going on in their eyes. Watch their, their faces sometimes. They just go on autopilot. We blah, 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 blah. And then they expect you to understand exactly what they said. So the elevator pitch can be helpful. Um, my elevator pitch for fundraising coach is that I make it, I, I um, exist to make it ridiculously easy to find fundraising training. So if you're going to do an elevator pitch, it's often your mission statement. Or use punchy words like ridiculously um, or something that would grab people's attention and, want, and get them to want to know more. But there's a way to do something as consistent as an elevator pitch without it becoming as belaboring uh, in your in your approach for it. And I call this the rule of threes. I didn't call it that. Kim Crisco in a book called The Art of uh, Leadership, Leadership in the Art of Conver Conversation, just, this was just an aside in his book. I'm going to go through it quickly, and then we'll walk through each step in detail. All right, first of all, I'm a firstborn, and so when I'm here in a rule of threes, I figure the last step in a rule, and the rule it must be, should be three. It shouldn't be four. So I start with the first step as zero so that by the end of the slide, you'll see that the rule of three has three steps. So that the first thing is you define your Jennifer, and we'll talk about what that means. Pick out your attributes of your organization. You brainstorm a whole bunch of things that your organization already does, and, and Kim Crisco called these your attributes. And then you choose the three that most, most likely target your Jennifer. You choose three channels of uh, communication to go through, uh, and this is everything. And the, the simplicity of each of these, these steps usually is what boggles people's minds. Um, but let's you, you choose three channels, uh, and then you choose the three. You choose a whole bunch of channels. You choose the three that will then most likely target your Jennifer. Then you commit to putting each attribute, one attribute in one channel, like attribute A in channel one, attribute B in channel two, attribute C in channel three, and then rotating it once a month for three months. But the beautiful part about this is the discipline. I don't think we'll ever have the um, – the slow pace of life that it would take to just talk about attribute A on the phone, attribute B in the newspaper, and attribute C on TV. And then the next one, talk about attribute B on the phone, attribute C in the newspaper, and attribute A on TV. And then the third month, attribute C in the telephone, and attribute A on the newspaper, and attribute B on TV. I don't think we could rotate it that well, I think what we're we what most organizations I work with, we take all three and we talk about them every month. But the discipline of doing that gets it so that we get grounded in our attributes, and it also extends for other people. What Kim Crisco said was that as you do this rule of threes for three months with this type of discipline, you'll find that you're telling the same stories, you're telling themed stories to your your supporters, your board, your staff. And the people that come to you in the fourth month aren't the people that you've been talking to. It's the people they've been talking to. Donors will come to you or people that may – or prospects will come to you and say, you know, I was talking to Joe, and he says you do boom, 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 and it will be attribute A, attribute B, and attribute C, or some version very close to those. So that's why this is just a powerful, powerful step. I know this is powerful because <laughs> the Association of Fundraising Professionals has um, the Rule of Three articles. Uh, article that I wrote uh, in their international whatever uh, resource center, and it was one of the top ten downloads for the last couple of years. So I know it's this this stuff is really powerful for your organization. So step one: define your Jennifer. You want to know everything you can about your Jennifer. You want it to be uh, the reason I get this. I call her your Jennifer is that I, I worked at the radio station in my early consulting days that had the, all of their programming was taken based on Jennifer. She was a 34-year-old woman who had kids. She was married. They knew what neighborhood she lived in. And they knew that if they played the music and they picked the, the radio personalities and they picked the stuff in between the music and the ads and all to target Jennifer, that 
the kids would listen if she left the room. If her husband would keep the radio on, and even her parents who lived nearby would also listen. They knew that if they moved their crosshairs over and talked to the the husband, they'd bomb. I mean, if they put some more sports in there, they put some more news, they did something that the kids would turn the radio off. The parents wouldn't even bother listening. So they knew they get their biggest market share by talking to Jennifer. So thinking about this with your own organization, this is really hard because we like to be, think that everybody makes it, would be a perfect donor and everybody would be a perfect client and everybody would be just the, the right person for our organization. And we have to get over that. We have to really start being specific and niching, uh, being much more direct in our approach because when we're trying to communicate with everybody, we communicate with nobody. So when you're trying to define your Jennifer, I would imagine what's your perfect donor? I'm a fundraising guy. That's what I. That's where my take would be. Um, so think about your perfect donor. What are the attributes that they have? Is it a male or a female? Be specific. Uh, is is your Jennifer uh, living in, in your community, living in a certain? You know, I was talking in San Antonio a couple weeks ago. The, the people there knew the zip codes that their Jennifer lived in. Do you know that specific, or do you just know region in the United States? Be as specific as possible. What's the what's Jennifer's income? How much money is she making? Is she making the money? Is her husband making the money? Is she married? Uh, what kind of kids? How many kids? What kind of kids? How many kids does she have? What kind of hobbies does she have? You can once you know this, you can do what Katja Andreessen in her book Robin Hood uh, Marketing. She says that then once you figure out who your target person is, as specific as possible. Go buy a bunch of the magazines that that person's reading. Rip out all the ads and put all the ads on the wall of your office because then you can look at all the, all those companies that spend millions and millions of dollars in market research, and you're able to then use that market research to see what are the triggers that people that those companies are trying to push with your particular perfect demo, your perfect prospect, and then you can start using those in your own marketing and your own fundraising as well. Really, you got to get specific with this. Um, I thought in one organization we lived in where I was working in Maine, I thought we were talking to an 84, 84 year old woman named, I called her Edith. She was widowed and, uh, she was, you know, had been through World War II, been through the Depression, and, um, or remembered her parents had been through the Depression. And so whenever I wrote fundraising material, I wrote letters I would write to Edith. Uh, and, and it was be along the lines of, hey, we, it, you, I wouldn't say these words, but this was the enthusiasm that I'd use in my, in my writing. We overcame the, the depression. We overcame Hitler. Pulling together, we can all overcome anything. Uh, well, it turned out after two years of being there, I actually did some research in my, in my database, and I found out that my typical donor was a boomer. 50% men, 50% women. So I named this particular Jennifer Pat. Some of you will catch the Saturday Night Live reference. Um, and I put a picture of a Pat in, on my commuter monitor, and Pat didn't really care. Woohoo, you say this is a good thing for the community, so what? What's in it for me? What's the proof? And so I had to change my, my messaging uh, and use a lot of views. You, because of you and your support to our organization, people's lives are being changed. So Jennifer, being really specific for your Jennifer is incredibly important. One church, uh, Rick Warren, who was the Purpose Driven Life, when uh, they were starting their church years ago, had what he called Saddleback, or their team called Saddleback Sam. This was the type of person that they were targeting. Um, they were, um, and you can look at this in your notes, but they had all the different pressure points. They had his values. They had what he, where his station in life was, his, uh, his views on religion. Um, they had it all in there so that they knew exactly who they were looking for when they thought of their ideal person that they were called to serve. Think about that for your nonprofit, too. Then, when you have that person clearly in your mind, and it takes some time to get that clearly in your mind. I was working with an Islamic relief organization who had their Jennifer, and then they realized that the Jennifer was a male, um, and they changed who their Jennifer was. And then they went back to, well, maybe it's the wife. Like in big fat Greek wedding, the male, the man is the, the the mom says the man is the head of the house, but the woman is the neck. She turns the head. So <laughs> you need to be sure which what it is. But once you get that specific, then get a blank piece of paper and just start writing down every single thing that your nonprofit does on a daily basis. 
this is where we get into the attributes. These are things you already do. I love this because it's not things you're going to do. It's not the buildings you're going to build or the people you're going to impact. This is the stuff that's happening on a daily basis right now. These are um, – the, when I usually do this with a team, people try to think about all the new things that have happened, the new things that are going on right now. But if you're a, a soup kitchen, are you feeding people on a daily basis? Write that down. Um, we had one organization that has an after-school program. They're talking about their after-school program. We have this program, we have that program, we have this program. And as we worked on this, it takes a lot of time to get really specific. Um, one of the people said, well, wait a minute, with our after-school program, I guess I never thought of this, but we have stable adults and ki at-risk kids' lives every afternoon, maybe more stable than what they're finding at home. Should we write that down? Is that something that would count as an attribute? Definitely. Write that down. Um, what's the, you, you turn on your lights every day. That's something that happens on a daily basis. Your staff or people that are visiting your organization, they eat at the area restaurants. It's something that happens on a daily basis. Write this all down. Be really, really simplistic uh, because what you want to do then is circle the three that most accurately target your Jennifer. What are the three that your Jennifer would respond the best to? Um, if, if, if your Jennifer is well, for one organization, she was in her 30s. She had a couple of kids, and so what they chose were um, swim safety was very important. Um, having the adult, the stable adult in someone's life, because uh, they did swim lessons, and so this particular Jennifer had a house at the lake, um, and she wanted her kids to be protected, so they knew how to how to swim. Um, the stable adults in the lives of the kids that her her kids went to school it was really important to her. And then self-confidence from karate uh, that was being taught the, was also something that was really important to her. Those are the three attributes that they decided to focus on. Uh, when we work with public TV stations, some of the things that they talk about are the world news programming, uh, the children's programming, and then the experience of having their family all sit together to watch something like Downton Abbey. So those are the, the, your three things can be whatever speaks most to the person you're trying to talk to. What you'll be able to see with this is that everybody, there's all sorts of people that can associate with these things too. Not just you, not just your Jennifer, but these are finely tuned for your Jennifer. Then you pick your three channels of communication. So, okay, you've got your Jennifer, you've got your piece of paper that has all the three attributes. Now you need a blank piece of paper, and again, it's so incredibly specific and, and almost it feels mind-numbing because you can't figure out how do you communicate. And it's not how you communicate to Jennifer at first. It's just list out all the ways that you communicate. Web, mail, email, phone, newsletters, and even staff meetings, um, direct mail, board meetings. I even worked with a horse veterinary practice that had a, they realized that when they end up there, finished their, their horse visit, they pick the horse's hooves and that's when the, the owner comes over to them every single time. So their water cooler was over the back end of a horse. <laughs> so they realized that was one of the three channels that they wanted to reach because they wanted to talk to their horse owners. S same thing, that specific. Everything out there, and then just choose three that you think Jennifer would be most likely to listen to. The older the older Jennifer is, the more likely she is to read mail, read the newspaper. But don't rule out social media. The fastest growing uh, segment of, of Women last time I checked, uh, uh, Facebook users last time I checked was women over the age of 65. That's because they want to keep in touch with their grandkids. So, so be sure to check that, look through that. And then choose the three that will most likely fit or, or speak to your Jennifer. And then you just pump each one attribute into one channel once a month for three months. So this is what it could look like graphically. If you have attribute A, uh, like your swim lessons, your attribute B is uh, the stable adult in kids' lives, and the attribute C is self-confidence. You could put that into attribute the swim lessons into the first channel, uh, stable adult in the second channel, and then self-confidence into the third channel, and then you just rotate it each month as you go. Can you see how this would be just gold if you have to write? If you have you ever had to write a newsletter? Blank white screen, right? Oh, what am I going to put into it this time? Now, you have your three attributes. You know, oh, wait, I need a swim lesson story, and I need a self-confidence story, and I need a stable adult and kid's life story. So much easier for you and your communications. I recommend you don't, you never start a meeting anymore without saying, okay, 
last since the last time we met last week or two weeks ago, what's the what's an what's an attribute A story that happened in the last couple of weeks? And wait until someone says it. Okay, great, thank you. That was a, that's a really good story. What's an attribute B story? Work through them so that the, everybody's keeping these fresh stories going, and it works also with board meetings. All right, since our yes, do you have staff that are attending board meetings, or if you have board members that are involved in your organization beyond meetings. You can say, okay, since our last board meeting, what was an attribute day story? Anybody? And don't say attribute day. Say this is what was our swim lesson story for the for the last month, and what was our karate story, and what was our you know, stable adult story. And let them. The more they can hear these stories and making it their own, the more they're going to be able to tell your story and sync from the same sheet as your organization and your marketing. You keep repeating it, and it this is powerful. Hopefully what you can see as we go through, again, we're going to transition into question and answer time now, but um, even with all the new nonprofits, which are just going to expand, by the way, at least in North America, boomers are retiring. They're having a whole second half of the second act of life. There's so much more life ahead of them. Many of them are just going and knee-jerk starting nonprofits without looking to see if there are other nonprofits around that are doing what they want to accomplish. So the donors are going to continue to get stressed and overwhelmed. But as we can target our stories and become much more focused about what either knowing our own organization stories well enough to know where to pick them out of, or if we are able to target them better to our Jennifer, they're going to, she'll be sitting across the table from us. He'll be sitting across the table from us. Really thrilled about hearing them and, and learning more. And with that, Anthony, let's let's take some questions. Thank you. I would now like to take your questions. If you have a question, please press star, then 1 on your touchtone phone. An operator will cue you when it is your turn. We will request that you limit yourself to one question. So that we may answer as many questions as possible, please phrase your question directly and as briefly as possible. If your question is answered before your turn and you no longer wish to ask it, then please press the pound key and it will be removed from the question queue. So once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one, on your touchtone phone. Our first question comes from John. Please go ahead. Um, if you have a board, um, I'm sorry, that's not what I want to ask. If you're <laughs> reaching out to a number of different uh, grant organizations, uh, foundations, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would have a bunch of Jennifers, is that correct? Um, or is this saying we want to know what we do, so that's our Jennifer, or are the Jennifers the individuals we're reaching out to to bring in money? See, that boy, it's like you read the script. If I, if I had to see the questions, this would probably be the one I'd want to see. So with. I, could I restate it, and are there more than one Jennifer? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yes, exactly. Okay, and that's that is an excellent question. Um, the there it depends on your organization. I mean, the, the simple answer is it depends. I I think the more that we can focus on just one, I, I can't keep a lot of Jennifers straight. Um, so I'm better at focusing on just one Jennifer. But if your organization has clients that you have either income from or you're trying to expand your outreach into a certain population. There will be a Jennifer for that, as well as a Jennifer for donors. Uh, foundations don't work as well as Jennifers only because um, each, because they're not a particular person, unless you know the person running it. Um, but if you have a, a, if you know that you have a sweet spot within foundations, there's a certain type of foundation that responds very well to your organization. Then you could definitely. They, one of the nice things about foundations is they list out their values on their websites. They list out their fields of interest, their giving priorities, whatever they call them. They tell you right up front, here's the stuff that interests us. Uh, and then you can start telling the stories with those. Um, some, some organizations have been sophisticated enough or confused enough to have um, hyper-specific, uh, a, an annual fund, Jennifer. So when they write their annual fund letters, they're looking for a particular type of respondent to that. And then a major gives Jennifer when they're talking their stories. What I think you'd find if you just do the exercise for one Jennifer is that the three stories that kind of rise to the surface with your team will translate across platforms. It's, um, 
you're not going to turn off anybody because you're talking about the three things that focus on one, one particular type of donor. Does that help? Yes, it does. And I wanted to say I thought your talk was superb. It really gave me a lot of ideas. In fact, I'm just energized right now. I can't wait to, oh, to attack all this stuff. Thanks so much, Chuck. It's hard not seeing people's faces, so I'm glad. Yay. That's great. There's Good. Thank you. Who's next? You're welcome. Once again, for a further question, please press star, then the one key on your touchtone phone. We have a question online from Erica. Please go ahead. Hey, Erica. Hi there. Thanks again for your presentation. My question is, I, I'm very much following um, the two portions of your presentation on how to develop and organize these stories. So just would like to hear you elaborate. We, it sounds like your recommendation is with our teams to develop our five buckets of stories, to have those available, to know those stories, to use those stories. But then the second portion, um, encouraging us to really look at our audiences our Jennifers, and then from that, figure out what are those key messages that are right from, for those donors um, versus repurposing some of those five bucket stories. Am I distinguishing those right, or it's how would you find it? Yeah. No, you're, that's, you're, that's an excellent, excellent way, question, Erica. Um, and honestly, if you've heard me speak before, you know I don't tell everybody their questions are excellent. So the fact that I said both of your questions are excellent, I, they are. Um, there's there's two ways to look at that. The, it's it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose to get this all out in 45 minutes and show you these two formats of organizing stories. But what you'll find, potentially, is that in your five buckets of stories, those three themes are repeated. Um, so there's definitely overflow, um, or it's it's not a – it's a semi-permeable barrier. There's, there will be given back and forth going on between them. Um, it, I think I, the way I look at it is that the, the store, the core, the, the core stories that your five buckets are is usually going to be more of the background information of your organization, and you'll want to keep harvesting them. You'll want to talk to your staff. You'll want to walk around and saying uh, those those iconic stories don't come up nearly as frequently as the Jennifer stories come up. So you want to be able to be to harvest it when it when one does come up. But the um Jennifer stories are much more in the day to day. They're happening every day. They're happening around you. And um what, no matter how small your organization is, whatever your nonprofit is is engaged in, one of those three things, because you choose things that are happening on a daily basis. They're just going to be fresh, and um, you'll start developing eyes to see them more quickly. Does that, does that help, Son? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate you confirming that. Oh, good. Okay. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth when I answer that question because it's it's not an either-or. It's kind of a both and. so thank you. Great. Once again, for further questions, please press star, then the one key on your touch tone phone. Our next question comes from John. Please go ahead. Um, my question now uh, really addresses um, the fact that, uh, okay, let me tell you what we are. We're an institute in the Texas Medical Center called the Institute for Spirituality and Health. And our mission is to uh, disseminate the knowledge and wisdom concerning the connection between spirituality and healing. And we do that by conferences reaching the physicians, nurses, and uh, all the staff of these hospitals. So really I'm trying to decide, including medical students. Um, so do, I, it's like I have about five Jennifers. And uh, <laughs> What would you say your five Jennifers are? Because I think you could be right. Who are they? I would think uh, the medical students would be different than, say, um, physicians in pri private practice versus nurses in the hospitals taking care of patients. So I was just wondering, um, do we try to address all five, or do we get um, sort of maybe we need to refocus our whole mission? I just wondered what this Whoa. is. <laughs> I don't want to cause you to, to feel like maybe you do, but I don't, what I would recommend uh, is that I, you could le legitimately have five. I, I work in the healthcare philanthropy, and I know that, that 
nurses respond to things differently than physicians. You have to talk to physicians in a different way than uh, do nurses. Medical students, I could see, would be, to would be different. And then donors might be medical students, or, or I mean, maybe physicians might be nurses or somebody else, but donors, people that are philanthropic usually respond to different things than people that fit. Like, a lot of doctors aren't philanthropic, so they give of their time, they give of their talent, they give of their other things, but not usually of their cash. Um, right. So that it would be a different type of Jennifer. Um, what I would recommend, and, you know, this would be a fun exercise to work through, is prioritize them. What's the most pressing right now? Either by calendar. Hey, I got, I'm going to be talking to a lot of nurses in the next three months. Let's figure out our, our Jennifer's stories for nurses. Um, or we need cash. We need to, we need to really beef up our, our fundraising, uh, right now. So let's talk about the stories to, to our donor and figure out who our Jennifer is there. The reason is, is part of it is what I hear is that you've got, You'd be telling stories to people that are supporting you, but you're also telling stories, rightly so, to influence people's behavior in the future. And those stories would be a little different. They could be the same stories, but your goal is to get them to actually be at least open to acknowledging the influence of spirituality and belief in health, yeah. um, which is a little different than getting them to take the action. And I guess the point where you can look at it, what's the action you want the story, the outcome of the story to be? Is your action to actually asked and engaged with patients about mental states and spirituality, or is it, a, is it to engage with patients, engage with, uh, with checkbooks? <laughs> if you want them to whip out their checkbook or whip out their credit card and make a donation, um, it, it could, and the, here's the other thing, done. it could be a different call to action. You could tell the same story about um, the this person being, I don't even know what the story would be. You, could, you might be able to get away with telling the same story and then just having a different call to action. Your call to action to the nurses and the physicians could be, would you be that healthcare practitioner that engages their, their patients this way? Can you see how the outcomes are better? Wouldn't you want to do that for your patients? And the actual call to action for the, the, um, the donor could be, would you be the guy that whips out that checkbook right now and makes this happen for these other medical students too? So, right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Once again, for further questions, please press star, then the one key on your touchtone phone. Our next question comes from Kathy. Please go ahead. Um, hi. I'm wondering if you could give an example of an effective use of a mess-up story with you, Jennifer. Yes, yes. Um, one of the best ways to do a mess-up story with your Jennifer is um, if your Jennifer has been kicked off by organization um, and there's something that was done to your organization that, or in your organization that they just didn't like. And then you could dip into a mess-up story and say, <laughs> you know, 20 years ago we had this happen. And you know what we found? I, we found that the value, we really, this is why they did that 20 years ago. And you might be able to take the edge off for your current Jennifer saying, oh, well, they're, they're, they're attracting people that are, happen to be go-getters. And so they weren't, it wasn't personal the way I was treated. Um, one of the ways I do it now is one organization I worked with I went through a spat of firing people inappropriately. Uh, it was probably good that these people were no longer working there, but it wasn't carried out very nicely. It was kind of carried out very knee-jerk and, and brutally. And so I was able to go through and say to them, boy, I'm sorry for the way that was that was handled. That doesn't sound like it, there's any respect shown for you at all. Uh, but I didn't apologize for the organization's choices. And now I can use that story, even though it's a different organization, as a message story that I can use in other situations too. Um, tons of healing came from that. And then your Jennifer may be a maverick. Your Jennifer may be the type of person who likes to take risks likes to think outside of the box, likes to kind of fly by the seat of her pants. And if that's the case, your method stories will be great because they'll totally identify. They'll identify making it up as you go along, even though that's not the only story you want to be telling. Hey, look, we're coming to the end of our time together. I want you to know I'm totally accessible at fundraisingcoach.com. Mark, M-A-R-C, at fundraisingcoach.com. If you have questions, Twitter, 
um, I forgot to check the tweet stream. Sorry, I'll respond to that, Mark K. Pittman. But I also, there's an ebook that outlines all of the slides and gives you all the different types of, just a recap of this, uh, that's at fundraisingcoach.com slash storytelling. It's only seven bucks. So if you want to get that, uh, share that with your team, you can definitely do that. And if you're a fundraiser, I've got this fun email, weekly email that I put out. And what I found in traveling around the world is many of the best fundraisers know what they need to do. They're just not doing it. So I have a thing called Fundraising Kick that um, I wanted to call Ask Kick or Kick Ask because it's supposed to be helping you um, get your ask in gear, get your solicitation in gear. But I didn't know if that would offend people, so I just put Fundraising Kick. So it's a swift email kick every every Monday or Tuesday that goes out. So there's a link for that on your website, too. Um, on your slide, too. Anthony, is there anything else that we need to do from, from our end? Um, no, uh, that's that's all, Mark, uh, unless you had any further closing remarks. No, I, I want to respect people's time, and uh, please, don't be a stranger. Feel free to contact me at mark at fundraisingcoach.com if we didn't get to answer your question today. Thank you, Mark. We would like to give some closing information, which is also listed in your dial-in instruction sheets. If you would like to purchase a recording of this conference, you may do so by calling 800 964 6033 or by using the enclosed order form. We encourage you to complete and return the evaluation form to us. If you are not selected to ask your question or have any additional questions, please email them to nonprofitquestions at pbconferencesinfo.com or fax them to 215 689 3435, and you will receive a prompt reply. On behalf of Progressive Business Conferences, I would like to thank you for attending this webinar. This concludes our program.